nothing happens in the real world unless it first happens in the images in our heads, Gloria and Zaldúa. In a convoluted way, I am protesting, protesting the usual way art is looked at being shoved into a period or a category, Nancy Spiro. Being a writer is like being Chicana or being queer, a lot of squirming coming up against all sorts of walls, Gloria and Zaldúa. I start with these quotations because they set the scene to introduce Isabel Widener, whose work as writer, critic, and trailblazing facilitator of innovative work always squirms, protests, reimagines the realness of the world for us, and offers opportunities to circumvent the walls that we come up against. Widener's writing and advocacy of a renewed innovative tradition in the last few years has been nothing short of exhilarating to see, and it recalls the heady dynamism of the avant-garde movement in British fiction in the 1960s around such figures as B.S. Johnson, Anne Quinn, Christine Brooke Rose, and Bridget Brophy. What if the earth were riddled with microphones? This sentence is just one of the many deliriously, deliciously put together palpitating sentences of Isabel's 2019 novel, We Are Made of Diamond Stuff. I pick it out, not just because it feels like it prefigures a world built on Zoom, um, but because it highlights what I think of as one of Widener's great gifts to the reader, an ability to hear the world speak, to hear what the structures of our world really say, but also to know fundamentally that the earth in all its resonances is already riddled with microphones too, but riddled in such a way that only certain voices get heard. And I see Widener's writing as an innovative, formally experimental, dazzling series of amplifications, amplifying the ways in which voices get diminished and unheard in the strangleholds of class, gender, sexuality, and race. Isabel's newest novel is Sterling Carrot Gold, just out from Peninsula Press in the UK and forthcoming from Grey Wolf Press in the US. It is most certainly a novel of coming up against walls and squirming for exoneration in such a way that exposes the inequalities and imbalances of rotten to the core power structures. This novel builds on the momentum of their previous novels, We Are Made of Diamond Stuff and Gaudy Bobble, which were shortlisted for the Goldsmiths Prize and twice for the Republic of Consciousness Prize and uh, won the International Literature Prize. It is no exaggeration to state that Isabel is one of the most radical and exciting voices in contemporary fiction. As well as their own writing though, Widener is also the programmer and presenter of This Isn't a Dream, a literary talk show uh, hosted by the Institute of Contemporary Arts London um, via Instagram Live, uh, and they also edited the landmark anthology of contemporary innovative writing, Liberating the Canon, an anthology of innovative literature. And, in, and uh, Widener has also written a series of catalogue essays, articles, and interviews in a range of publications such as the New Statesman, uh, the ICA's Kathy Acker exhibition catalogue, and Freeze, titled, uh, with titles such as Class, Queers, and the Avant-Garde, an alternative art history of the 1990s, and there is huge unexplored potential in innovative literature, in which they've begun a wild and compelling process of acknowledging, encouraging, seeding, and contact tracing a vigorous and radical queer class conscious literature for now. Okay, time to check all the microphones of the earth are unmuted and working properly. They will be once Isabel unmutes. Please welcome Isabel Whiten. Colin, this, was, this introduction was a thousand times better than my talk's gonna be. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, that was absolutely incredible. Can you email it to me afterwards? <laughs> Thank you so much. I really am honestly honored hearing this coming from you. It's, it's a pleasure. Thanks really briefly to Maria um, for inviting me and to Katie for organizing it and to all of you guys for, for coming. Um, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a really, really rough overview of um, the various aspects of my practice, which Colin already did much better, as I said, but I'm just gonna really briefly talk you through um, the different things that I'm doing and that I consider part of my research practice. Um, I show you this on a couple of slides, I think, and then um, the main part of my talk will be a reading. So nothing fancy, just a reading um, from my new novel, which will be like five or seven minutes or so. And then um, 
I'm more than happy to answer your question. So um, think of anything that you might want to ask and send it my way. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen briefly. You know how it goes. So this is my new novel um, that Colin already mentioned. Hang on, let me just briefly. Um, it's called Sterling Carrot Gold. Um, this is the one that I'm going to be reading from in a minute. And um, it's a formally innovative novel published by Peninsula Press in the UK. And um, it's just come out a couple of weeks ago and um, by Grey Wolf in the US, um, but not until last year. So Sterling Carrot Gold is what we term um, practice-led research. It's, a, it's a obviously creative writing as a form of practice-led research. And I can say a lot more about this um, when, when we have our conversation. Um, meaning obviously there's a difference between writing a novel or writing a novel as research and um, maybe this is of interest to you what the difference um, is between um, these two approaches to um, creative writing but um, the main um, sort of um, the core idea of Sterling Carrot Gold is that it's a surreal inquiry into what I'd argue are the real effects of state violence on gender non-conforming working class and black bodies. Um, so what I've, I say a few words about what I've been doing in this before moving on to some of the other stuff I've been doing and then getting back to this one and reading from it. So like in my previous novels um, and my creative critical work, Sterling Carrick Gold develops a fundamentally interdisciplinary writing practice. I know Maria uses this term as well, interdisciplinary writing, which is where it's at, if you ask me, in terms of creative writing and in terms of creative critical writing, in terms of anything. So it develops um, a fundamentally interdisciplinary writing practice, drawing specifically on contemporary and historical performance practice, practices and traditions in this case. For example, um, there's a playwright called Mochisola Adebayo, and um, she's developed a concept she calls Afri-queer theater, which combines um, like um, Black British writing um, and theater with, um, with, with um, queer writing as well. So it's an intersectional practice in a way. So I've been drawing on some of the ideas that Mochisola develops in her work, I, I'm always inspired by poets theater in the US, which is also a tradition that combines poetry and performance in sort of mainly DIY ways, but um, there's all sorts of approaches to it. And I also am um, really inspired by contemporary British um, queer and trans artists, like for example, Alex Margot Arden and Caspar Heinemann's recent work. Of, which is also like a um, DIY, DIY trans performance in a way. So I'm taking some of the ideas that these poets um, performers and artists have developed in their own work and I'm putting them to work in creative writing in a way. So Sterling Carrot Gold also operates across various formal and genre distinctions. So for example, it works across literary fiction, across memoir, across nonfiction and sci-fi. It works across the creative and the critical, and it works across what traditionally has counted as high and low cultural registers. So for example, it puts into dialogue um, some take on Kafka's um, modernist novel, The Trial, and um, UFO mythologies. So it puts, um, he sort of um, puts into dialogue um, sort of registers of writing that not conventionally, conventionally speak to each other. And my argument is in a way that um, this way, this enables me, this allows me to develop a truly intersectional, and um, I don't, don't really want to use that now overused word decolonial, but it's a properly intersectional, a properly queer, a properly trans and working class creative writing methodology. So this is what Sterling does, and I um, can say about it more in the questions, but, and I read about it, uh, from it as well in a minute. So then I just show you a few other things. Okay, this is We Are Made of Diamond Stuff that 
um, Colin also mentioned, this is my previous novel. So in a way, it um, sort of starts to explore some of the themes that I always explore, you know, like you will know this, every researcher has sort of their obsessions and their fixations that, um, that they keep bringing back in each new um, work. So I've laid some of the groundwork for Sterling in, in this book, Diamond Stuff. It does some th similar things, but um, here it's mainly with a focus on looking at Brexit at the time, it's come out in 2019, and um, it looks at the migrant experience, the queer migrant experience, and um, it also looks particularly at certain class struggles as well. One thing that this book does that maybe Sterling does a little less obviously, it um, brings in um, some, it explicitly engages with um, critical writing as well, so specifically, it um, draws on Jasper Poor's work on homo nationalism, and it also um, sort of creatively um, explores Paul, the social scientist Paul Willis's work on working class um, countercultures in schools from the 70s. So um, these critical debates are properly engaged within them. Um, in, and, and explicitly engaged with, obviously on the, engaged with in the novel as well. Um, actually, I'm not gonna not say nothing about this, this is a play. I wrote for an exhibition in Dundee, which was really cool by Peace Staff, called The Prince of Homburg, but let's skip this. I wanted to um, take a little bit of time to talk about um, another, something else that I consider a really um, key aspect of my practice. So of course I'm a creative writer, but um, for me, there's certain, actually Colin expressed this really well. I don't, I can't remember now how, but um, the, this idea of um, having, um, of sort of um, foregrounding a community, community building aspect of um, innovative writing was really crucial to me. Um, this idea of creating a wider context within which writing like mine can emerge and is um, completely fundamental, not just to my existence as a writer. I mean, I don't wanna be alone. I wanna be like um, working with people like Colin, Maria and so on. Um, but also um, it took me a very long time to find um, the kind of queer, writing that I'm interested in, where I came from, a working class background that didn't, I did, um, is sort of a so-called non-traditional background, which is like code for working class really, or, or often black or writers of color. And um, so when I started writing about 20 years ago, full time, really, um, there wasn't much of a context. I was really um, looking hard for it. I was aware of, eventually became aware of Maria's work with art writing and The Happy Hypocrite. But um, there, there wasn't um, a lot in terms of innovative writing, um, specifically from working class and queer cultures around. So one aspect of my work is really to, um, to shape this, um, what I think is this potential of creative writing to actually work as a community, as, like a, as a medium around which communities can, can shape and um, sort of... Um, thrive almost, you know, without being too optimistic. Um, and in poetry, this is already happening to some extent um, in fiction, prose writing, um, interdisciplinary writing, arguably less so. So one of the things here, this is the um, slide that you've been staring at for ages, um, is this, um, I start from the back, this is the most um, recent thing I've been doing in collaboration with the ICA. I've collaborated with the Institute of Contemporary Arts for um, three or four years now, quite intensively, um, which I'm really grateful for. So this um, latest thing started is, a, is like a literary chat show. Um, it's run on Instagram Live. We've been through two series and we had people like, you can see the right loop, who are this trans um, art critic duo. Um, Irenison Okoji, the um, novelist and short story writer, 
Prontus Purnell, who is a performer and um, author of a, a really cool book called A Hundred Boyfriends, and you, Lemmy, the, um, also the, the writer. So that's the second series. We also had other people like Sophia Almaria in the first series, and um, I'm, I'm Mike Harrison, I'm John Harrison, the science fiction writer, and um, so on. Anyway, the point is that this is um, a regular slot. It's fortnightly. It's up on um, it's live on the ICA Instagram, which has like a broad reach, a really wide. I mean, I guess they have like hundreds of thousands of followers or something, maybe 150. I don't know, but it's a proper, properly um, mainstream platform, and we are presenting um, this innovative work. This um, what people would consider consider unconventional interdisciplinary writing. Um, it's really, it has like a, 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 it's creating a proper platform for it and people tune in live and it's also available to watch on the ICA um, Insta as their IGTV. So it's, uh, the archive is up there if you wanted to have a look, if you missed it. So it looks like this, this is me and Prontes um, and it's me in the right loop. <laughs> so you get the idea. So I consider this um, part of my research as well, because it's also about how can we present and how can we um, enact and perform these forms of writing in an embodied way that is a little bit more interesting compared to maybe conventional readings at literature festivals, which many of you know can be like a bit dead. <laughs> okay, um, really importantly, this was the original collaboration with the ICA called Queer Street This. This was a um, proper live event series in their big theater space that I run with an artist called Richard Porter. Same principle, platforming, um, innovative work by um, writers, poets, and, and performers and artists, and creating a community and, a, and some sort of a cultural landscape around it. Here you can, this was, it was like this. So it's also about us thinking how can we present it differently again. So we do this by setting up a, a, a stage in the middle of the with the audience on four sides. So it's like a boxing ring, and already something as simple as that takes it away from like one person standing in front of a microphone and like um, re reading more or less. Um, you know, <laughs> enthusiastically. I don't want to be so down on conventional read reading practices, but I, I think the, the question that interests me is how can we make it um, more lively, more interesting? Here you can just see some of the audience. And so basically audiences like this sit around on four, on four sides around this um, little stage and which already sort of puts the reader in a position of having to turn around and having to navigate the fact that people are looking at you from all sides. I mean, maybe it's a little bit um, horrifying as well, the thought, but it, it sort of, had, if, in our experience, it has really broken down this um, distinction between audience and performer a little bit. And it has, um, it has um, sort of led to quite, surprising and, and unconventional interactions between people. Okay, and just finally, this is um, the anthology I edited, laying out some of the ideas that I mentioned in the talk, liberating the canon, and it has lots of other writers in there as well, queer, trans, black writers, working class writers. It's 100% incomplete, but it's a starting point. And um, for those of you who are interested, have a look. I am gonna stop sharing. So this is roughly what I do, at least a small um, part of it. And um, unless you want, anyone has any super urgent questions, I was gonna do like a five minute reading so you kind of know roughly what I'm talking about. So I read from this. It's out now, it's come out two weeks ago. So. It's kind of new. I guess to me it feels it's old, <laughs> but this is what happens. There's always this um, slight delay um, to, to write, work in on something and then until it then comes out. But it's not that old. They actually turn it around quite quickly, I would say. It looks like this. It's, it looks kind of cool, quite cute. Um, 
So I'm going to read for about five or six minutes, I think. And um, I'm going to read from chapter two. And um, you don't need a lot of context. I just give you sort of the big signpost so that you can follow what's going on where in, at the place where I jump in. So basically, there's this main character called Sterling. And in the very first scene, Sterling is attacked in the middle of Camden Town in London. They're attacked by these bullfighters. So it's like a bit, little bit surreal, but in a way it's like a, I don't know, I don't want to like interpret this for you, but it's like some metaphor for bully. I mean, they're, bull, they're being bullied, they're properly like attacked, which um, I'm sure, which is, which is something that can happen to you as a queer person and has happened to me in my life but not by bullfighters. So the, if Sterling is attacked um, by bullfighters in the first scene, that's all you need to know because there's a reference to it. Um, they're saved by some character called Rodney in the first scene. Um, and um, they don't know each other yet, but sort of Sterling is immediately like a little bit enamored with Rodney. They're like this really cool other um, trans or non-binary character. And they sort of save them um, in a way. And but the most important sidekick in the book, arguably, and especially in this scene, is Sterling's best friend called Chachki. And Sterling and Chachki, they would known each other for a long, long time. So they're like this, they're best friends, but they're like this ancient couple. They sort of sometimes get on each, each other's nerves a little bit, just because they know each other so well. But the important thing is they run like a queer performance series together called Cataclysmic Foibles. And there's a, re a reference to that in this section as well. Uh, that's all you need to know. And this is like a scene where Sterling, he, uh, Sterling they've just been at um, uh, Chachki's house and is now walking home and they're encountering someone who says they're a time traveler. So this is the scene that I'm reading. Having dropped Chachki off at their block, I continue walking up Delancey Street towards mine and the exact same person, Chachki or so it seems, is Chachki or so, is, or so it seems, who I dropped off seconds ago, is now walking towards me, talking and gesticulating with urgency. Not only is this Chachki so called, positioned impossibly in relation to where I just left them, they are dressed in an outfit entirely unfamiliar to me, namely a too tight, cheap looking two tone polyester two piece, second hand car dealer style, and tassel loafers, which arguably counts as a look somewhere New Jersey. They've got their hair slicked into a center parting and unfairly are showcasing a neatly clipped pencil mustache the likes of which I've been trying to grow for a decade, but haven't been able to, and more to the point, doesn't exist above Chachki's upper lip either, or it did seconds ago. And what's that smell? Is that eau de cologne? This Chachki in that two-tone two-piece, orange or purple, depending on the light's angle of incidence, is talking non-stop and inappropriately loudly in an effort to get my attention. But I'm sorry I'm already listening to the staticky sound that their suit makes in motion, the clicking of their loafers on asphalt, and la 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 la, the singing in my head, and yet I can hear Chachki cheap copy chatting at me, repeatedly saying about an important message they wish to convey and get this about the not too distant future, hence they hail. And if there was ever a point where I was following them, I'm now lost, metaphorically speaking. Literally, I just arrived outside my flat. I stop, throw caution to the wind, look pseudo Chachki straight in the eye and ask, what message? Chachki secondhand car salesman stresses that under no circumstances should I do what I'm planning on doing tomorrow, Saturday, but that I should put my not unfounded reservations about the police to one side and report what happened to me earlier today as a priority. They're referring to the bullfight, of course. Go police, they say. That is the message. I'm sorry, who are you? I say uncooperatively, and as a rule, I don't take instructions from strangers. But it's me, Chachki, Chachki center parting insists. And I admit that there's a softness in their eyes that is vaguely familiar, alongside a mercilessness that is irreconcilably alien. It's this mercilessness, this determination, beyond even the suit, the mustache and the eau de cologne that renders them unrecognizable to me. 
I'm telling whoever this is that they aren't Tchotchke. Their blatant inhumaneness being just one of the many, many reasons. I know that they are not Tchotchke, but an imposter and a charlatan. What's this now? They're pinging unsolicited, unsolicited photos to my phone, depicting me and Tchotchke in unfamiliar scenarios. One shot against a backdrop mimicking Baghdad and one featuring ancient superstructures in where? The Belizean rainforest, Chachki Sosi says. So I say as if and dream on, the furthest I travel is Forest Gate to the east, Forest Hill to the south, Westbourne Park to the west, and Glasgow to the north. I have never been a tourist or a global citizen or part of an international chat set at all. I've stayed put since first I arrived in London in 2001, perhaps to minimize travel costs, perhaps all I've ever wanted was a home. Photoshopped, I say, disparagingly, also nonchalantly, as if Chachki con artists' photos don't look impressively realistic and aren't getting to me. But they do look realistic, they, and they are getting to me. I start deleting the images as they come in. I can't delete them quickly enough. Trash can, trash can, trash can, waste basket. While Chachki perfume counter keeps bombarding me with their unlikely photos and videos. There are short clips of me looking disorientated in San Francisco. Never in my life have I been San Francisco. Are you sure you want to delete? Yes, I am sure, delete already. But then phony Chachki pings over an image of Rodney and myself in a car park outside what looks like a North American mosque. And I hesitate, not because of North America or the mosque, but because of Rodney, myself, and the unimaginable familiarity existing between us. Chachki4711 now corners me in the entrance to my block, saying, look at me, as if that would change anything. You aren't Chachki, I repeat, like a mantra or a protective spell. I prove to you that I am, they say. And how are you going to do that? They say chariots, Roman spa, three words, six syllables, denoting the place the real Chachki and I met 20 years ago, a life-changing encounter for both of us. We'd be nothing without each other, and neither of us would be anything without cataclysmic foibles, and the latter wouldn't exist if it weren't for Chariot's Roman Spa, the gay sauna in Shoreditch, East London, 1996 till 2016, RIP or gentrification. Chachki Cologne says it again, namely that they, Chachki tassel loafers, are Chachki. The only difference being that they went back in time to put me off my ill-fated plans to go Hendon Football Club tomorrow and to urge me to go police ASAP, ideally tonight. Or else I say being difficult, I say that I don't remember having informed Chachki my bestie, nor Chachki from the future of the precise nature of my plans. In fact, I kept my messaging deliberately cryptic all day to prevent unsolicited interventions. I didn't want to be in a position of having to justify or defend my plans to go hand in tomorrow, nor to Chachki, nor to them, a cheap alter ego in a pencil mustache. You didn't, Chachki Inflammable Fabric confirms, but that's where time travel comes in. They didn't or will not find out what I did or will do tomorrow morning until tomorrow evening, which was circa three months ago, and also too late. They have seen things in the future, they say. Talk of cryptic messaging. <laughs> I leave it at that. <laughs>